Okay, welcome to another session of our class this morning. So in the last class, we talked about, uh, in the last class, we talked about uh, hardware configuration. We looked at um, the various hardware, peripherals and devices with their classification. And from my screen, you also agree with me that um, we also looked at um, the components inside the CPU box, the desktop box, all right? And you can see here, as you can see, we still have them on the screen here. We have the power supply, the drives, the processor, the RAM, the cards, and the likes like that. Then uh, in conclusion, we also went to the peripherals, the ports. Looked at the ports. Looked at uh, the various ports. We were able to identify them. How to believe that you went back and uh, to get one and then looked at it yourself to practice. Then we talked about the types of devices. Okay. So this morning we quickly, I want to finish the theoretical aspect of this course today. So that next class we just focus on the theory, uh, the practical. So let's talk about softwares. Software refers to the programs that you use on your computer, like the word processing program, or the programs that make your computer work, okay? Programs are also called applications. Programs are also called applications. And it can also be defined as part of a computer that cannot be touched, but can be seen, felt, and experienced. Okay, that's another way to define the software. Unlike a hardware that you can touch, you know, you can't touch a software. You can only experience it. You can only see it when it is working or in operation. Okay, so let's look at the types of softwares and their categories. The first one we'll be looking at what we call your system software, known as your PD system. There are the basic software programs that are needed for a computer to work. A PD system is the basic software programs that are needed for a computer to work. So the system software is also called your PD system, okay? But however, they are needed for a computer to work. It's like when you buy a vehicle. Without fuel, the ignition cannot start. That is how important the operating system is. Basically, what the operating system does is that it is a software that uh, connects all the hardware together, that ensures that all the hardware respond and function as expected. Okay? And commonly, all the operating system use what we call the graphical user interface. GUI mode <laughs> to help the user to help the user easily input instructions and other programs. Unlike uh, back in the days when we were using Windows 98 and below, we were using command prompts to install operating system on this computer. And then we had computers with processor of uh, Pentium 1, 2, 3, and even 4. Before I was using uh, XP anyway. <laughs> But then we we're using command prompt. But now all the software that we have from Windows XP upward, they are a graphic user interface mode, which allows the user to be able to install it because it is interactive. You can read the instructions of what next to do, what next to press, what next to enter, and then you can be able to install it easily. The most common of these operating systems are the Windows family of operating system, which is manufactured by or produced by Microsoft. We all know Microsoft's company. So examples of the Microsoft Office system are Windows 98, Windows 2000, Windows NT, it means new technology. We have Windows XP, Windows XP or Libertad. Private Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows 8. We even have Windows 8.1 and Windows 10. We have Windows 10 as well. Yes, I 
Ah, eu não lembro. Não. Bem. So, application software. Application software, we have, um, it's also called an application package. Application software is also called an application package. And we have, um, in total, we have the utility software, and then we have the productivity software. The utility software, this is a broad category of programs that allow a computer to perform tasks that aren't a part of the operating system, but are still practical and useful. For example, a utility might instruct the computer on how to copy or burn information on the CD-ROM, or it might be an antivirus program. Okay, so basically what, an, what a utility software does is to enhance the performance and the operation of the computer system. Usually there are some of these programs that comes pre-installed with the operating system. Okay, but the utility softwares are more advanced form of the software. When you have your system, you can be able to burn or write files into a CD-ROM drive uh, disk, okay? The same thing, there are some operating systems that come with their pre-installed antivirus. Usually they call it Windows security. And most of they have an upgrade you can have if they have a partnership with my McAfee or not on. You have it pre-installed. But then it is, it is usually a trial mode that you have for them. So when you now buy a G software like the not uh, Nero, Nero is used for burning files to CD ROM. Nero has a higher capacity. Nero has a higher capacity of, uh, of uh, uh, and it gives you more functionality of what it can, of how it can uh, burn files to the CD ROM drive. Okay? The same with the virus. And the virus is able to better protect your system from, better protect your system from viruses. Okay? Because the Windows security that is pre-installed with your operating system has limited functionality of how it can, uh, you know, prevent virus attack. All right. Then we have the productivity software. This is one term used to describe the type of software used to perform standard office computer tasks. Word processing, presentation, spreadsheet, and database software are all common examples of productivity programs. The most common set of productivity programs in Microsoft Office is the Microsoft Office that is offered by Microsoft Corporation. Okay, so productivity software is basically a generally software that enhance your productivity. It gives the user the ability to perform standard office uh, tasks or computer tasks. Examples are uh, the Microsoft Office. Under Microsoft, we have Microsoft Word. Uh, Microsoft PowerPoint is presentation. You have uh, the word is for processing, word processing. You have Microsoft Excel, which is known as spreadsheet. You have Microsoft Access, which is a database soft, uh, database software, and just like that. We also have CorelDRAW, which is also a productivity software. It allows you able to do graphic designs and just like that. Then we also have Adobe too. Okay, we have Adobe. So under it now, you have the breakdown of each of these productivity software. What Microsoft Word use for word processing, Excel used for uh, spreadsheet, Access used for database creation, PowerPoint used for presentation, Outlook used for email application, Microsoft Publisher used for publishing, Microsoft Front Page used for website design. And then you have them in various versions. This office comes in various upgraded versions. From Office 2000, you have 2003, 2005, 2007, 2010, 2013, and 365. Those are the upgraded versions of Microsoft Office. Then we have the Corel Draw file. The Corel Draw. This application is used for graphic design and also comes in different upgraded versions. Okay. Now the Corel Draw usually has is a, also a, a combo package, just like Microsoft Office. You know, the Microsoft Office has different uh, breakdowns, just like Corel Draw too is a combo. Then we have the Corel Draw Basic, which is used for the graphic design. You have the Corel Photoshop, which is used for image design and editing. You have the Corel Capture, which is used to capture screen events. You want to capture whatever is happening on your screen and in picture mode. Then we have the Corel Tree that is used to trace an image. Okay, so the various versions are Corel 8, 
Corel 9, 10, Corel 11, Corel 12, Corel X3, switch stands for 13, like a Roman figure, X4, X5, X6, that's Corel 16. I think we have Corel 18 too. We have 17, we have Corel 18. Then we have Adobe. It is used for different applications, from publishing to ebook and so on. It's also an Adobe is also a combo. It's just as most Adobe are usually standalone. So you can get them as always as standalone to install if you don't want if the combo is not available, unlike Office and the rest. So Adobe, we have the Adobe Photoshop, which is used for image editing and design. Their versions are seven Adobe Photoshop, seven Photoshop eight, we have CS2, CS3, we have CS5 and the rest like that. Then we have the Adobe Reader, which is used for ebook, ebook, used for ebook when you convert your, your, your files to ebook format, you can be able to try, you know, send it online and it can be easily read by anybody using any form of uh, devices. It also comes in various upgraded uh, versions. We have the Adobe Reader 4.0, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, we even have 11. Okay, and they all have uh, the more they upgrade these uh, programs or softwares, the more functionality, the more exp user experience that you get from them. Adobe PageMaker, which is used for book publishing, we have them in Adobe PageMaker 6.5, 6 7, and then the rest like that. So let's look at the difference between this software and hardware. What is the difference between software and hardware? Software is a general term used to describe a collection of computer programs, procedures, and documentation that perform some tasks on a computer system. You can see that now. That is a general term used to describe a collection of programs, procedures, and documents that perform some tasks on a computer system. Practical computer system divide software systems into three major classes. We have the system software, programming software, and the application software. Those are basic three major classes of a software. Although the decision is arbitrary and often blurred, okay, that is sometimes it may not be clear to some people. Software is an ordered sequence of instructions for changing the state of the computer hardware in a computer sequence. Okay. <laughs> It's an ordered sequence of instructions for changing the state of computer hardware. You can see that to change the state of computer hardware in a particular system. That means a software is used to control the computer hardware in a particular sequence that it wants it to go. Software is typically programmed in a user-friendly interface that allows women to interact more and more eff efficiently with the computer system. Okay, because of various upgrades. Now, those softwares give you ability to be more efficient to be user friendly so that we can be more efficient with the use of our computer system in terms of control and the rest then what is hardware hardware is best described as a device such as a drive that is physically connected to the computer or something that can be physically touched you hear that now it's best described as a device such as a hard drive Example is a hard drive, or example of a device you are talking about here is a hard drive that is physically connected to the computer or something that can be physically touched. So anything that is physically connected to the computer or that you can touch is known as hardware. A CD ROM, a computer display monitor, your printer, your video cards are all examples of computer hardware. Without any hardware, a computer would not function. You can see that now. Without the hardware, the computer will not function. And software will have nothing to run on. So the, the hardware and the software, they are like uh, five and six. One cannot function without the other one. If there's no hardware, there's no way the software will be, will, be seated, will be installed on, okay? And if there's no software, there's no way the ad, ad, hardware will be able to, to work and function. So they are five and six, they work hand in hand, okay? So hardware and software interact with one another. Software tells hardware which task it needs to perform. So it's just like, so what we are saying is that, uh, and this time what we are saying is that the, the vehicle is your hardware, the driver, eh? the person that drives the vehicle is the software. So, you know, when you, when you start your vehicle, 
you determine where your vehicle is going to move to. You want to go front, you want to go back using the bus mode, you want to turn left, you want to turn right. It's a driver that should do does that. So the software is a driver that drives the, the hardware. Okay, the software drives the hardware and instructs it on to onto which task it has to perform. Okay. So let's look at the various differences now. We have them, we have a comparison chart here on my screen. Okay, it's a comparison chart here. So we're going to be comparing hardware and software based on these various um, um, key points. Number one is the definition. We said devices that are required to store and execute or run the software is an hardware. A software is a collection of instructions that enables a user to interact with the computer. A software is a program that enables a computer to perform a specific task as opposed to the physical component of the system. You could also say in the definition that the software drives the hardware and performs and instructs it on which task to perform. That's another definition. Okay. So just look at the basic definition of hardware and software, and then you can compare the two types. What are the types of hardware? What are the types of software? Types of hardware, we have them in input, storage, processing, control, and output devices. Okay. And you can, and from what we have discussed earlier in the, in the previous class, we talked about the various examples of input device, examples of output device, examples of storage device, and things like that. The software. Software system, we have the system software, we have the programming software, we also have the application software as discussed. Then function. So let's look at the difference between hardware and software in terms of their function. Hardware serves as a delivery system for software solutions. It serves as a delivery system for software solutions. The hardware of a computer is infre infrequently changed in comparison with the software and data which are soft in the sense that they are readily created, modified, or erased on the computer. What we are saying is that hardware serves as a delivery system for a software solution. It is used to deliver the software solution. And it is usual, it is infrequent, it doesn't, you don't change it frequently like the software. Okay, so let's look at what the software is saying. It says to perform the specific task you need to complete. Okay, to perform the specific task, you need to complete. And software is generally not needed to for the hardware to perform its basic level task, such as turning on and responding to input. Okay, so those are the basic functions of these two. So let's look at examples. Now we are now we are now breaking down the from types to examples. So we have examples of hardware. We have the CD-ROM, the monitor, printer, video card, scanners, labels. Routers, modems, we have the, the, the pens, uh, light pen, you know, and rest like that. For so, uh, software, we have QuickBooks, which is an accounting software. We have Adobe Acrobat. We have the Google Chrome, which is a, a browser software. We have Microsoft Word for Microsoft. We have Microsoft Excel, Apple Maps, and rest like that. All those software, application software that I gave you, all those um, system software that we just taught you a few minutes ago, those are examples, breakdown examples of. Of the of, of software, so we have this. So let's look at the differences in terms of their interdependency. Hardware starts functioning once software is loaded. Hardware starts functioning once software is loaded. To deliver so for software to deliver a set of instructions, software is installed on hardware. So you see now, the hardware can only function once the software is loaded. But then for software, it's has to be stored on the on the hardware before it can carry out any function. Then failure. Hardware failure is random. Hardware does not have increasing failure at the last stage. So you see that hardware failure is random. That is not like frequent. And hardware does not do, and hardware does have increasing failure at the last stage. So at the last stage, that is when you use your hardware and use it over time over time, they will, the rate at which to be start failing you will increase. The software failure is, is systematic. Software does not have an increasing failure rate, okay? That it doesn't start failing you even as far as long as you have the system, except if you have virus issues, okay? Durability. Hardware wears out over time. Hardware wears out over time. 
software doesn't wear out over time. However, bugs are discovered in software as time passes. So what we're saying here is that for hardware, you know, it's a physical component. It can experience wear and tear. You can, some parts can get uh, damage, maybe as a result of it falling down, maybe as a result of uh, uh, it, as a result, it could be as a result of uh, dust, you know, and stuff like that. But for software, they don't wear out over time. The, the software will be as long as it is in your system, it will be there. The only thing is that bugs may be discovered in, soft, in software as time passes, okay? We tend to discover some bugs. Bugs are sometimes uh, like um, uh, unused files. They become unused files that, become, that begins to pile up on your system. Now let's look at nature. Hardware is physical in nature. Where software is logical in nature. Hardware is physical in nature. That means you can see an hardware. That's why we say it's physical in nature. But software is logical in nature. You can only experience it. You can't, you can't really touch it. You understand? Or like I that you can touch because it's physical. So it's logical. So let's look at some the last chapter of our course today. I see how we can quickly round up on it. So let's look at the computer operations. Computer operations. First of all, we'll be looking at Windows. Windows. Now, all these things I'm thinking is very important <clears throat> in system troubleshooting. So that you, when, when, when you're able to detect a problem, you can know, you can able to know what the problem is and then be able to know how to rectify the problem. And it will be using all this information will be useful for you when we get to the next class, which is a practical class. So a window is a separate viewing area on a computer display screen in a system that allows multiple viewing areas as part of a graphical user interface. Windows are managed by a Windows manager as part of a window windowing system. A window can usually be resized by the user. For example, it can be stretched on any size, side, minimized, maximized, and you can close it. So what we are saying is that a window what we're saying is that a window, that viewing path or that viewing area on your system, when you, like, like what you are seeing on my screen now, is the viewing part of, of a system. So that's what we call the windows, okay? And I can resize it. I can increase it. I can reduce it. I can close it. That, okay? So on today's multitasking operating system, you can have number of windows on your screen at the same time, interacting with each, with each whenever you choose. So. I can try to have different window um, window viewing on my screen at the same time, simultaneously different window viewing at the same time. The window first came into general use as part of the Apple Macintosh. Then later, Microsoft made the idea, the foundation of its Windows operating system, which was actually a graphical user interface for the disk operating system on the IBM compatible PCs with these computers. Okay, so let's go to booting. Booting. Booting is a startup sequence that starts the operating system of a computer when it is turned on. Get that. Booting is a startup sequence that starts the operations operating system of a computer when it is turned on. That is, once you power your system, once you press the power button of your computer system. Booting starts from the sequence. It's a sequence that starts from when your system is turned on. Because when your system, by the time you own your system, actions begin to take place. Okay? So that's in the inferior sequence. So that process is called booting. A boot sequence is the initial set of operations that the computer performs when it is switched on. So you see now, a boot sequence is the initial set of operations that your computer performs when it is, when it is switched on. And then during this boot process, the computer will perform what we call the post power on self test, and then load necessary drivers and programs that will help the computer and devices to communicate. In essence, what we are saying is that in, what we say booting, booting is a sequence that your system performs from when the system is powered on. And then the booting sequence is the initial set of operations. So every operation that is that is being performed or that occurs once your power your your power your system is what we call booting. Okay. 
And then in that process, one of the things you perform in that boosting process is called post. Power on self-test. After it does power on self-test, then it now low, goes ahead to load the necessary drivers and then the programs that will help the computer and the devices to communicate. The power of self-test is that the system is going to test the, the devices, whether they are functioning, whether they are available to perform tasks, whether the devices, the hardware are available to perform basic operations. So it's going to test each of them. Once each of them respond positively, the next stage is now to start loading the drivers and the programs that make them start communicating to each other to perform, to come up, and then for you to be able to use them. Now, there are two types of two basic types of uh, booting. We have the cold or hard booting. We have the warm or soft booting. When the computer is started after having been switched off, when the co so a, a cold or hard booting is when the computer is started after having been switched off. So that what we are saying is that you have switched off your system is is off. So you now woke up in the morning, you want to use your system, you now put it, press the power button. You just switch off your system for the first time. Okay, that's called cold or hard booting. Okay, that's cold or hard booting. But when we say warm or soft booting, is when you are already using your system and then you now perform the task of restart. Okay, when you restart your system, that's what we call the warm or soft booting. So without switching off your system, by the time you restart it, we call it the warm booting. And sometimes you perform that task of restarting your system when your system either crashed or freeze. You know, the screen just freeze like that. You don't know what to do. You can do it and restart. And usually desktop system have that special button. Desktop system have that special button that even if your system freezes and cannot even access the, the power control from your software to restart or shut down your system. With the desktop system, they have that uh, portion where you can just press the restart button and by itself, system will restart on like a laptop that does not have that uh, features okay both types of booting clear out okay for the time being the box the bombs memory conflicts and other idiosyncrasies of the operating system i get that now so anytime you you start your system or you or, or you power up your system and start all over as you are fresh at least for the time being, it removes any form of box, any form of unnecessary files, any form of uh, unnecessary uh, memory conflict that you may have experienced from the system at that point in time. So both the hard and the soft booting, that is the code and one booting, can be initiated by hardware such as the button press or a software command. Booting is complete when the normal operative runtime environment is attained. So, when your system now, when you now, when you pile your system, when you pile your system, and then after, then at the point you now get stable, you now have your screen, everything is set to. That is when the booting operation is set to have been completed. Okay, that's why you see it has been completed. So we have what we call the bootloader. A bootloader is a computer program that loads, that loads an operating system or some other system software for the computer after completion of the power and self-test. You can see that now. Now, you know, we said that in booting, it performs the power and self-test post before you start loading the software. So it is the bootloader that begins to load the software after the system might have performed the power and self-test. OK? So it is the loader for the operating system itself. And so what it does is that it loads an operating system or any other software immediately after the completion of the post. So that is, so once you start loading the software, it's saying that the computer, the hardware should start to function together. Now, within the add the boot process, it runs after completion of its self-test, then loads and runs the software. Loads and runs the software. A bootloader is loaded into main memory from persistent memory, such as hard disk drive, or is of older computers from a medium such as punched cards, punch tape, or magnetic tape. The bootloader then loads and executes the processes that finalize the boot. Okay, 
The buyer then loads the and execute the processes that finalizes the boot, like the post processes. Now the bootloader code comes from a hardwired and persistent location. Now, if that location is too limited for some reason, that primary bootloader calls a second stage bootloader or a secondary program loader. So what we are saying here is that if for any reason, okay, that what we're saying is that the bootloader, the load, the code for the bootloading comes from what we call a hardwired and persistent location. Now, if that particular location where we have the bootloader code is too limited for any reason, okay, if it's too limited for any reason, it now initiates what we call the second stage bootloader or what we call the secondary stage program loader so that it can still be able to load and perform its the task, okay? Now, when it, when at any point it can't do that, then we say there is an issue that needs to be, you know, troubleshoot. We need to troubleshoot to know what may have actually uh, happened. Now, the program that starts the chain reaction, which ends with the entire body system being loaded, is known as a bootloader or bootstrap loader. Okay, so that is that on bootloader. So let's look at boot devices. Boot devices. A boot device is the device from which the operating system is loaded. The boot device is the device from which the operating system is loaded. A boot device is the device from which the operating system is loaded. So, you know, when you, when you load your operating system, it's loaded inside a place in your hard disk. So, the hard disk is an example of your boot device. Now, a modern PC BIOS, that is basic input output system, supports booting from various devices. This includes the, ad, the local hard drive, optical drive, floppy drive, a network card, and a USB device. Typically, the BIOS will allow the user to configure a boot order if the boot order is set to CD drive, a hard disk drive, or a network. So what we are saying is that anywhere, any device that you install your operating system, any device that you install your operating system is known as a boot device, okay? And you can install your base system on your CD drive, on the hard disk, on the USB drive, on the network card. You can install your software on those devices. So let's look at uh, boot sequence. There's a standard boot sequence that all personal computers use. First, the CPU runs an instruction in memory for the BIOS. That instruction contains a jump instruction that transfers to the BIOS startup program. This program runs a power self test to check that devices the computer will rely on are functioning properly. Then the BIOS goes through the configure boot sequence until it finds a device that is bootable. And a device that is bootable are devices that has been that um, software has been installed. Okay. Now once BIOS has found a bootable device, either at this network card USB, then the BIOS loads the boot sector and transfers execution to the boot sector. If the boot device is a hard drive, for example, it will be a master boot record. The master boot record checks the partition table for an active partition. If one is then found, the master boot record code loads that partition's boot sector and then executes it. The boot sector is often operating system specific, okay? However, in most operating systems, its main function is to load and execute the operating system kernel, which continues startup. Okay. So if there is no active partition or the active partition boot sector is invalid, then the master boot record may not load a secondary bootloader, which will select a partition and load its boot, boot sector, which usually loads the corresponding operating system kernel. So you can see that. Even the way they are programmed or designed this uh, process is to ensure that if one fails, there's a backup that ensures that system still uh, uh, function. So this is what we'll be focusing on. I'll just introduce to this aspect. We have um, just three minutes left. So this is where we now be looking at all these things we have learned so far. How do we now? How does it now relate to troubleshooting? What do we? How do we now apply it to system troubleshooting? Now, what is computer troubleshooting itself? 
Compliance of Michelin is a process of carrying out investigation into identifying system failure and providing immediate solution. It's a process of carrying out investigation into identifying system failure and providing immediate solution. Types of system software. We have the system failure, we have the hardware failure, we have software failure. So your system you can experience the failure in terms of hardware, you can experience failure in terms of software. So either of these two, you can always troubleshoot them to be able to diagnose what the problem is and then recommend a solution. Now, what are basic or possible hardware failures? So these are hardware failures, these are computer failures that are related to the basic components or peripheral of your computer system. They are hard disk, memory, CD-ROM, or GPT-ROM drive, processor, sound card, VGA card, keyboard, printer, monitors. All these are hardware that could develop any failure or fault at any point in time. Then we have the software failure. These are computer failures that are related to the software installed on your computer system. They are system software, application software, utility software, productivity software, all those softwares that you have could fail at any point in time. So there is need for us to be able to ascertain why the failure, okay, and then fix the, the problem. The The successful, you successfully carry out basic system submission. A working peripheral must be okay to, to successfully carry out basic system of shooting. A working peripheral must be available to test and replace the component. So what we are saying is that for you to be able to carry, successfully carry out any form of troubleshooting, for you to be able to successfully identify the problem of a computer and then provide a basic solution, you must have a working peripheral. Again, in terms of hardware, we must have a working peripheral that will be available for you to test and then replace any component that you may have found to have had any problem. Okay, so I'm ending my class for today. My time is up. So the next class, I need you to all, you know, go and study hard. I'm dropping my email. I'm supposed, to, I don't know, I need you to, <clears throat> I'm sub dropping my email and I need you to send me a mail okay i need you to send me a mail to request for your assignment send me a mail between today and tomorrow to request for your assignment because you're going to be submitting it for me and because I, I will need you to submit your assignment before the next class okay i need to submit the assignment before in the next class so between today and tomorrow send me a mail requesting for your assignments for this particular course basic computer maintenance and troubleshooting thank you for today god bless you see you next class <laughs>